And let me open up my screen. Okay, there I am. And I'm just quickly, give me a second to adjust the screen. And I will be ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. It is so exciting to be here. Thank you, Naftali, for inviting me. Um, this is this is a concern. I mean, I, I coach teachers a lot, and um, teachers are telling me that they're really, really nervous about what's going on. So that is the big question. What is going on? What are we doing about this bridging the academic gap? It's making everybody so nervous. And um, do you have to be nervous? That's really what I'm here to discuss. So let's talk about putting the pieces together. So later on, you're going to be getting the webinar. Um, I, I believe Jeff Tully said he's going to be emailing it to all of you. So if you want to know more about me, it's all here. But I'm not going to spend time on it now. OK, so session, session objectives. What is an academic gap? What are we worried about? And what are the concerns for the new school year? And how will I cover my curriculum? How will the gap affect my teaching? That's really what the teachers I speak to are saying to me that they're nervous about and they want to know, so what should they do? Well, we're going to know for successful if we can understand the challenges ahead and be proactive with dealing with them. And if we can set ourselves up in a proactive way and we can then, you know, have success. So here we go. Let's see what we know. So first of all, everybody take a big deep breath. Guess what? The academic gap is not a new issue. This is good news. Although we just went through a historical, unbelievable, unprecedented event, the honest truth is this is not something that is new to research. Really, 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 the academic gap is not a new issue, and it's something that we have lots of research to pull on, which is great, which makes us calmer, because we can go and see what do we know. So first of all, what is an academic gap? What is the research on? So first of all, it's about the teacher's school expectations. You know, if you've been teaching for a while, you pretty much have a set sense of what you teach in your year. You know what you teach and you know how you teach and you know what you expect the children to know. You also have the common core standards, you have the testing that you always have and do, and you have your curriculum. So when children aren't ready for what you're expecting them to be ready for, that is what teachers feel is an academic gap. There's also the student student levels. That is the activation of students' prior knowledge when you discover that some children in your class know certain things that other children in your class don't know. And the independence levels. Some children are able to sit and work on their own and some children are really helpless, whether it's learned helplessness or whether it's fear. We're gonna discuss all those things later. There are children in your class who are going to have different levels of being able to do their work independently. So these are what we're going to address as we go through this webinar. So what do we know? We know that No Child Left Behind was an um, answer to an academic gap problem. Basically, the government decided that schools were failing to take um, you know, lower income or lower academic um, ability children seriously. And so they made it the teacher and school's responsibility to raise that gap. And you know what? Still big gap. And we also have research and at the, at the bottom and at the end of the webinar, at the bottom of each page, you can see some of the places I got some of my information from. Um, there's an increased, the increased reliance on homework widens the academic gap. Not every parent is able to or, or is around to help a child do the homework. And without support, the child is not able to do the homework the way the teacher wants them to do it. And therefore, there's a gap. We also know that every teacher I've ever met complains about the summer slide. Summer slide is that big gap between how they ended the year before and how they come into the new year. And children who receive summer enrichment or, um, or go, on, go to camp and travel, they're going to have more skills and be a little more settled than children who have not been sitting and doing any learner, learning the whole summer. And we know we just had a basic summer slide because it was a five-month break from formal schooling. So that's really something to think about and consider as we walk into September. Now, let's take a minute to think about why 
COVID-19 made this academic gap even more serious. Okay, let's look at this list. There's a lot of parents working. Essential workers are not able to be home and homeschool their children. These people kept us going, but left their families for many hours a day. Whether it was clerks, or it, were, it was baggers, or it was um, delivery people, or Amazon. I mean, we're all ordering. Did we ever think about who's filling those orders? Doctors, nurses. There are so many people, cashiers, grocery stores. There are a lot, a lot of parents who were not home when we were basically trying to run the remote distance learning situation. Um, lack of technology. Um, there are a lot of articles on who is lacking technology and how it affects them. Siblings home. Folks, it's hard to find quiet space. Um, I teach a college class and one of my students um, says she sits in the, in the closet to be able to have less noise and be able to concentrate. Small living quarters, sick family members. COVID-19 made a lot of people sick. Death of a grandparent or a loved one. Loss of parental job. That's going to be a problem for parents. That's going to be a problem for the children. Neglect or abuse, a reality we don't really like to think about. Parents unfamiliar with the material being taught. I mean, I don't think I'm able to just pick up a seventh grade math book and just dive into math. So that's complicated. The kinesthetic learner, the over-involved parent and the stress there. The under-involved parent and the lack of stress, shall we say, there. Video games, nice weather. I'm sure there are things you can think of as well. In fact, I'm quickly looking at the chat, which I don't think anybody added anything because I got no notifications. Um, if you think of more, please make sure to add it in. Let's connect past research to the post-pandemic classroom. So we're looking at September, and we're nervous, but we're not going to be nervous because we have the answers in front of us. So what has research discovered? So there are research-based strategies, and I like to almost like Put them together a little bit to think about how we can deal with them. So the first thing is evidence-based instruction and monitoring progress. We need to teach a little differently and might I even add the way we should really be teaching in the year 2020 anyway. We need to be teaching constantly, constantly checking for understanding, constantly doing a quick, should I go on? Did the class get it or should I stop and re-explain? If I teach something, do they have enough background knowledge to be able to, to get the material I'm teaching? Or should I back up and teach a little bit before so that they, I can lead them right into what they need to know? Constantly doing formative assessment. Then the rigorous curriculum. There's lots of evidence out there that we should be teaching at grade level and not below the grade level. And unfortunately, many, many schools and many teachers I work with actually teach below grade level. And then the testing is on grade level. And all the standardized uh, uh, pretests and book things are all on grade level. And so children, children struggle. But evidence, there's evidence in research-based based, um, studies to show that we should be teaching at grade level and emphasizing basic skills to increase the comprehension. So we really need to think about that because staying at grade level really will bring everybody up instead of dumbing everything down um, in an attempt to bring everybody up. Next, supplemental instruction. So if we're doing a rigorous curriculum, then there's going to be gaps appearing. As we notice a gap, we need to make sure to, to address it and then return to core instruction as soon as possible. And we're going to discuss this in more detail, but we need to make sure to use the assistance that we have, ask the office or this principal if there are any extra floaters around or, or subs that might not be busy that day, and really make use of extra adult help so that if your class needs supplemental, you're able to give it and able to have the assistance help you in the classroom. Or if a child needs help, the child can fill in a gap, learn the material, and then come back. Now, our children have not been focusing. So we need to be engaging one every one to two minutes. There should be no passive learning. Every one to do two minutes, we should be checking, and we'll be talking about this more, just quickly checking and engaging our students. 
and we need to remember we need to motivate and engage. If it's too hard, there's going to be decreased motivation and engagement. You know, I remember Ron Clark, who has the Ron Clark Academy in Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he talks about the fact that when he first started teaching, he was breaking his head with certain children in his class and they just weren't absorbing material. Maybe they had trouble memorizing, maybe they had trouble reten with retention. And yet those same children were able to do a whole rap song that they were able to memorize from the radio and sing at recess and maybe even jump rope to. And he was trying to figure out like, well, how does that work if they can't memorize, but they can memorize. And the truth is, research does say, if a child is motivated, somehow they're able to work around some of the disability that they experience in education. So we have to make sure, and we'll talk about this again further on, um, how to use themes and technology and choice and different in differentiated instruction to enhance motivation and engagement. We focus on concepts and not skills. By having an objective, we activate prior knowledge. We have skill practice, but we're making sure to really concentrate on the relevance for the children. And then we have closure where the students demonstrate knowledge of concepts. So again, this is an overview and let's get into the nitty gritties. So, for, <coughs> excuse me, formative assessment is really a biggie. That's really the first thing we have to keep in mind. That we're teaching through formative assessment and that will lead us to targeted instruction. So let's look at this for a minute. I have a few slides here with lots and lots of formative assessment tools. Now here's the thing, all of you are educators, I'm sure you have your own formative assessment that you like to do. But I just want to remind you of something important. Before we go on to the, each of these formative assessment skills, you have things you like, but we tend to stick with what's comfortable for us, and that's not really a good idea. Uh, there are some classrooms that are constantly doing thumbs up, thumbs down, and thumbs up, thumbs down is awesome, but it shouldn't be the only way we monitor if children are getting the information that we're giving over. And I have tons, I see one teacher constantly doing this strategy or that strategy, but really, let's mix it up. Let's get out of our comfort zone as well, since we're asking children to get out of their comfort zone and learn what we're trying to teach them. So, please take a minute, and if you don't have time now, that's okay. You're gonna be getting this webinar in your email, and you'll be able to look at this in more detail, taking more time, um, and look at this, you know, and really see which ones talk to you and which ones you can use. And again, at the end of this webinar and at the bottom of every page is where I got these different formative assessments to share with you. New clothes is just asking you, asking children to use it a different way than the way they've been taught. So for example, if a child really understands the scientific process, then they can talk about how, how interesting it is. Detectives use that when they're pursuing criminals. We observe data, we form theories, we test theories, we draw conclusions, so that's interesting. Or do's and don'ts. A child's able to list three do's in one don't, or three do's in two, or three don'ts. So, example from math, when adding fractions, do find the common denominator, do add the numerators once you found the common denominator, and don't simply add the denominators. Again, when a child's able to say the do and don'ts, then you have a whole different level of comprehension. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for real comprehension of what we're teaching. And so we're teaching real things, nothing fluffy, nothing floozy, real work, and making sure children have mastery. The next one is three most common misunderstandings. When a child can go ahead and say which three most common misunderstandings of the topic the class might think of, um, they're again, they're able to pulling the information apart and they're giving over to in a different way. Remember, we can call on one child to do these formative assessment tools. We can call on every child with a whiteboard. We can have children use index cards and hold them up. There are so many ways to use as many children as possible and then randomly go ahead and read children's answers for them or have them read it to the class. The yes, no chart, what you do understand, what you don't understand three questions, right? Think of three questions for the topic at hand and rate their importance. Explain what matters, okay? Um, let's say, for example, I say I'm explaining to a three-year-old 
or I'm explaining to a singer, or I'm explaining to my mother. Each audience is going to be, the information is going to be explained a little differently. So explaining to a singer might be, a thesis statement is kind of like the hook or title of one of your songs. It delivers the message that the song goes on to explain. Um, okay, uh, for a mom, I might say to my mother, you know what, a thesis statement is like a blurb before the recipe, and it tells me what, what, what I want to cook, why I might want to cook it, and what I need to cook it. Um, so that's something I would be explaining. Big picture, Venn diagram, draw it. Draw it is, I know people think draw it is for little kids, but draw it is also for older children. We don't ask big kids to draw enough. And it's amazing what we see when they're asked to draw for information. Self-directed response, okay? Something that helps a child um, explain something to themselves. Entrance and exit tickets. I know many of you do exit tickets. You ever think of an entrance ticket? Three question, shall we call it quiz when the children walk in? Doesn't have to be a quiz. It's just a quick, um, uh, carefully thought through three questions or three words um, that children answer that you collect and as a teacher you're able to then direct your lesson and possibly even adjust your lesson if needed keep the question going i find this lots of fun where you ask one student the question and the next student has to continue adding something to that question and it keeps going and they all really have to listen because they're not answering your question they're answering the string of questions of what they're being asked now I want to stay on this paper, this page just for one minute because I want to explain how I use these things. Parking lot. I've gone to workshops where the parking lot is on the wall and people have to stand up and put post-it notes on the parking lot. And I find that a little bit disrupting, disruptive. So my suggestion is not to have such a parking lot, but instead to have children put post-its on the corner of their desk. And the teacher, as she's walking around the room, can pick up the post-its and he can or she can read those post-its quickly, glance at them every once in a while. Sometimes I'll have three post-its in my hand and sometimes I'll have 10 and sometimes I'll have none. And some of them are like the chat, a quick, you know, um, you're talking too fast or, um, oh, I like that idea. And others are, can you re-explain I didn't catch or do we have to know this for a test? And by you Going ahead and having those post-its, you're able to just put in your little thoughts and share with the class and make things more relevant and, and provide clarity, and it's very, very helpful. And children really like the fact that there's a sense of, wow, it's in real time, the teacher is actually listening to me, and I don't have to interrupt, and I don't have to... Um, I don't have to get in a power struggle with the teacher, but the teacher is responding to my concerns. Now, number 14, this, this blogger calls it the one minute paper, but I have seen it many times as what stuck with me today. And it is awesome. Um, in one school, the prin a principal told me that every single teacher is using it now. And it's just, it's fascinating because if children know at the end of the period or at the end of the day, they're going to have to write something that stuck with them you know, it ends up meaning that they're going to think about, as they're listening, they're going to think, oh, I'm going to write that. Oh, no, I'm going to write that. They're going to be on a different level of paying attention. And that's what we want. We want children in class to really be listening. And if there's a this thing that they have to do, and peer pressure is peer pressure. The children know their friends are also doing this, and their, their classmates are they're all doing this. So they're going to also want to put something relevant and meaningful on the poster. So if you don't have a lot of space, I put two uh, sample pictures up to show you. One teacher has something that actually leans in the corner against the wall, and another person is using her, her door. Um, classroom space is at a premium, so these are teachers using space that they otherwise wouldn't be using. Etty, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, and I keep okay. checking for chat. Is there anything I'm not seeing? No, not at the moment. So first of all, I did want to make sure you could see it, and I also wanted to encourage everybody to use the chat for questions. I was going to ask you, if you don't mind, to just sort of circle back to the first slide and then maybe spend about 10, 15 seconds on each one as we consider asking everybody on the call to identify what are 
of the 14, there's a lot of strategies here. And of course, we would love to master them all and use them all. But practically speaking, that's not so realistic. So the question then becomes, how can we identify a couple of strategies that are most meaningful to you? Either you're already using them and you like them, or they're ones you'd like to learn more. So, Etty, if you could sort of circle back. Actually, if you don't mind, I just want to make sure it's a complete webinar because this is really such a small uh, part of the webinar, knowing that you were going to send it to them. I know they have time for this. At the end, I would like to circle back at this time. Okay. okay so if everybody Thank could just you. make a mental note of that, that would be great. Absolutely. And it is important. And when I made these slides up, I really wanted to spend a lot of time on it. But then as I continued with the webinar, I realized there's a lot of things we really are nervous about for September. And I want to be able to address those before we circle back. So I hope you do have time to circle back. And everybody, please make note of things that you do for formative assessment that you can share with us as we go through these 14 little things. Okay, thank you, and that was a great point. Um, okay, so now we talked about the, the formative assessment piece, and that's important. But now let's go back to the research-based strategies and talk about engagement. Our children have not been formally engaged for a long time. At this point, it's three months. Even if you tell me using Google Classroom, even if you tell me that you used Zoom, um, some of you did teleconferencing. There were all different ways that you taught, but I have to tell you, I have spoken to many, many parents, and they're in awe of the job you, parent, you teachers are doing, but at the same time, their kids are just not relating to the Zoom experience and the Google Classroom experience as, as they do in the classroom. I mean, it's just not the same, it's a flat screen. So children turn on the computer and they keep their video off and they play games and, 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 and play on their phones or they doodle or they keep their video on and you see their faces but they're watching somebody that's past the screen and you don't see them. So we really need to make sure that we're engaging our students. And the truth is before COVID-19, I was speaking to teachers about making sure to engage more often because we like to talk. I mean, we are teachers. We went into this because we like to hear our voices, but um, the children are in a very strange situation where they're sitting by desks and they're supposed to just listen to us. And that's passive. So we have to make sure that we never ever use a name in a textbook in a word problem that's not a name from a kid in the class, that we don't say anything without turning to someone saying, um, what'd you think? Can you explain that concept? Repeat back to me, have you ever heard of the concept? Everybody class, let's all say photosynthesis together. We've got to keep them engaged and on their toes because that is the way that we're gonna really um, shorten the gap. We're really gonna close the gap if we can have everybody's brain on and with us. So then we see that confusion and we're able to clarify. If a child's spacing out, it might not be because the concept is hard, as much as you're talking for more than two, three minutes and they're not used to that. You can be the most dynamic person, you can be so exciting and still not have everybody's attention. And the way to have attention is to actually call on students and have them repeat things and have them comment on, on information and making sure that they're part of things. Rigorous curriculum. We talked about we should teach at grade level, not below grade level. So make sure that children feel that. Make sure they understand that you know they're smart, and so you're, you're talking about something that, wow, usually is taught in older grade, but hey guys, I can tell this is something you really are gonna understand and get because I see this is something you're interested in. I mean, when I taught history to seventh and eighth grade, I made sure to really engage the boys by cowboys and by skyscrapers. And I made sure to really engage the girls by flappers and the roaring 20s. Is that sexist? I say no. I say that genders have their own interest levels. And of course, if a boy is interested in the roaring 20s, of course, I'm not ignoring the boys. And of course, if a girl's interested in, the, in cowboys and skyscrapers, I'm not ignoring the girls. But I'm making sure to recognize interest level. And I'm making sure to keep the curriculum rigorous, but an interesting pace and, and leads us into motivate and engage. Thematic, um, using technology. If it's too hard, it decreases motivation and engagement. Um, I was talking to 
a school about how to take what we just learned about Zoom and about, about Google Classroom and how children did do well in certain areas and how to bring that into the classroom. And we came up with a center-based strategy where um, children would be sitting in different centers, no matter how many children in the room, um, a third of the room would be using computers and doing vocabulary, this is an ELA hour, um, vocabulary and writing, uh, not writing, I'm sorry, vocabulary and spelling and um, something that doesn't need that back and forth with the teacher involvement. Then the next center would be teacher-based, where she could be using or he could be sitting and doing a novel um, and doing that novel study. And then the third group could be doing work like writing and, and peer review that the teacher can then um, at a different point of the day, look over and have quiet conversations and conferencing with the, with the students. There are so many ways to not drop what we've learned and add it into our curriculum. And again, more motivating, more engagement. More engagement, less of a gap. It's amazing how much we've learned that children who are taken out of the room for, for, um, for supplementary education how much more learning they do with their bottom of a higher learning, a higher level learning class than if they're put in a class of their peers of their of, of their level, um, because there's less pressure in a in a lower um, a, a class that's demanding less from them. And now the homeschool connection. It's really important to remember that increased homework does not help, it only widens the gap. At this point, asking for parental involvement is probably a mistake. First of all, parents are done. They are so completely finished. They don't wanna fight with the kids about doing homework anymore. They experience what it means to be a teacher and many of them said, this is why I didn't become a teacher. Um, and so therefore we don't wanna increase homework that it needs the parents' involvement. We do want to increase the motivation for out of school work. And I'll just share with you that in younger grades, I found it very, very helpful to do things that make the kids beg for more and let, let them then do more at home. For example, we wrote um, essays uh, in third grade using lots of adjectives and, um, and we worked on you know, um, making sure that the sentences flowed and if they really went ahead and wrote well, and the topic was animals and zoos and things like that, if they were able to really compose a really good writing, they were able to make a puppet and put it on the puppet. One of my weakest students was still making puppets for homework about three months after we finished the task because she didn't realize she was working. There she was creating essay after essay and showing it to me and getting permission to pick another puppet and make another puppet for homework. And she didn't even know she was working and to her skills for writing and for, and for I, I, we kept going over the, the flow and what we start with and how do we end it and, and, the, and the, uh, the punctuation and all that was, she was improving so much because she was interested. Um, another thing we did was Mad Libs. I introduced Mad Libs to my class. Then I had them in a different day. It was actually a rainy day. Um, I sent them around at recess to go to other people and other teachers, and I signed them where to go, and they did it with other people. And they were so excited to present them what they came back with, they begged me to get more, and I said they could do it to people at home. So there I was, having children begging me and doing night after night tons of Mad Libs, going ahead and, and, and reviewing adjectives and adverbs. If you don't know what a Mad Lib is, you're missing out. Go find out what Mad Libs are, and you can even make your own. Um, and children working so hard at home doing work that they liked. Um, another thing is for older children, um, every time I finished a unit, I had open ended uh, assignments where they had to show me they understood and they, and they were able to um, present the information. But I was very vague. I really had very few things on my rubric. And I had children who stood up and did raps did dances, did plays. Um, some did an actual, you know, book report paper with the plastic on the front and the back. But most of them were really creative. Some created PowerPoints and some created um, uh, smart boards. I mean, it was really, it was unbelievable how creative they were. And again, they didn't need involvement from their parents. They were just interested in doing this for their friends. 
So that's really important. And there's gonna be road homework, but this might be the time of year when they all go back to school. That instead of giving 20 problems in math for homework, you give three. They either know it or they don't know it. You have them, um, little kids, you might, want, you might be able to have them call a special hotline and read on the hotline instead of having parents um, so busy with it. You might change your rules. Maybe they can read to somebody older than 10. If a child's older than 10, they could be the ones listening to the reading. Um, by the way, that just reminds me of a signature contest where the children can read up to five times and get a signature for each time they read. And it goes into this big chart in school and it's unbelievable how many signatures we collect and we get to a certain number, we have a quick party. Um, these are all things that increase motivation. Everybody's working so hard and in the end, we. We, uh, we, we cut out the, the academic gap because the kids are all working and all interested. I remember there was a fifth grader who was not reading. We had a contest going on in my classroom where um, we wrote down how many pages were read and how many books were read. And we're looking for 10,000 pages and 100 books. And each time we got 100 books, we had a party. And each time we got 10,000 pages, we had a party. So one child wasn't reading. And I called his mom and I said, look, you can even read baby books. So he'll add to the, he won't add that much to the pages read contest, but he'll definitely add to the books read contest. And just by being excited about reading a, a, a children's picture book to a little sibling, he will then be part of the excitement and maybe move on to reading longer and more age appropriate books. And it was true. So I definitely beg you to think about how to encourage the children to learn at home in a way that does not need so much parental in, um, involvement. Also praising precisely. Research, I laughed when I heard this because I really, it struck a chord. Research shows that parents see caller ID, either the teacher or they see the school, and they don't answer the phone. So try really hard in September and October to call every single child's house at least two or three times. And make sure that you call with just precise praise. And see what happens. And in November and December time, when you really are seeing what the gap really is, and you're seeing that this child is just not able to do A, B, or C, and you really need to come up with a plan, when you call after those few months of building that trust and praising precisely, that parent is going to be on your side. And that parent's going to be much more open um, to be talking to you about, okay, let's put our heads together. What could we do about the situation? Newsletters, emails, texts, WhatsApp. I have never seen more connection than I saw during COVID-19 between um, school staff and parents. And let's keep that up. And if for some reason, your school didn't encourage it or you didn't encourage it, start encouraging it now. Um, it meant a lot. All the years that I taught that I sent out newsletters at the end of the week, I just sent them out in an email blast. And I just said what we did, what we accomplished, and what's coming up. No demands, but just, you know, a peek into my classroom. And parents just felt good. They felt like they knew what was going on. And some parents never read the emails, and they will never read the emails. But that's okay because they're there. And if they choose to, they can know what's going on. Now, we forgot about one other part of this, uh, this situation, and that's the students. So we talked about the teachers and how they feel. We talked about the teachers and how they need to stay on level and they need to keep teaching skills in a relevant way. What about the kids? They're gonna walk in and the older the child, the more anxiety there might be and the more um, fear of failure there might be. And that often leads to misbehavior. So it's really important to understand that you have a lot of students who have fear of failure, perception of academic lag. You're assigning this? Oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this. I can't, I can't, I'm not doing it. Like, like a lot of that kind of stuff that'd be going on. Yes, we've experienced it before, but now the perception of academic lag is gonna be big and it's gonna be real. And we need to understand that it's there. Also focus, we talked about this. Children are just not used to focusing. I mean, school's long hours. Any school I spoke to, they pretty much had like, half an hour of Zoom and then children working on their own. Um, they had maybe twice a week live conferences and twice a week recordings. Um, there were many different things that schools did, but I mean, these long hours, that's a lot to jump into. And it's not like we do it slowly. We don't go in September saying the first week we're doing one hour and the second week we're doing two hours. What we do is we say, okay, we're starting school morning, 
to evening. So we, we need to make sure that we remember that this is hard for them. And also accountability. There wasn't that much accountability. We tried, but there was, wasn't that much we can do. We understood that COVID-19 meant, meant families were not in great situations. We understood that children did not have quiet places to learn. And so we understood that our accountability was off and children did not have accountability. So now they do. And we're gonna have to deal with that as well. And peer pressure. Many children were really happy about the lack of peer pressure and now it's back. Now they're gonna be looking around wondering what do kids think of me? And if I say this answer, will, be, will I be laughed at? So if we keep this in mind, we will be much more proactive about what we do. And so therefore we have to make sure to make the classroom welcoming. We have to make sure to redefine our classroom rules. You know, I taught for 30 years. I don't know that if I'd be going back into the classroom this coming year, if my rules would be the same. We have to really say, one minute, do they make sense for the students? Do they promote a healthy learning atmosphere? Are they eye roll inducing? Can you honestly answer the why? But but why? Can you answer that question from your rules? So you need to really look at your rules and really tweak them. The kids have not been in school for five weeks, five months, by the time September rolls around. And many of them are like, hey, that works for me. Why, why do I have to learn like this? Can you answer that question? Think about what you're asking the kids and then see if you can redefine your classroom rules. Also, we're trying to bridge the gap. Therefore, make sure that you only allow children to go out to the bathroom, to get a drink, to the nurse, to the office. Unless it's an emergency, they should only be going out at individual work time or break time. When you're explaining something, you need every child there. And if you're, if you're explaining something and a child's not there, you're gonna have to re-explain it and that might add to the gap that we're trying so hard to bridge. You also need to understand your own absent policy. I mean, I have a daughter working in a school that is a, a mainstream public school and kids really feel like they could be absent five days and nobody cares. So if we're trying to bridge the gap, well then being in class matters. So try to see what you can do to motivate and encourage and make sure that kids really feel like they belong in your classroom. It's a welcoming place and it matters if they're there. Call apps and children, put names and phone numbers on the board, have the children feel missed. Also, remember that they haven't been together in a long time and groups have been together depending on where they live, how they were able to get together. So prepare for re recess and unstructured time. Teach and model social skills. Discuss the relevance of the modeled social skills and follow through on anything taught. Discuss games, discuss rules, discuss how to play, discuss being a sore loser, discuss being uh, a, 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 um, a, a grateful, humble winner. Um, also, parents need to know what you want. Be very clear in communication. Write no writing homework in the writing homework section where you write your homework. That way, children and parents know there isn't writing homework. We don't know what dynamic happens in this five months where parents said, you gotta do your homework. And the child said, yeah, yeah, I did it. And they didn't do it for real. Let's limit the amount of, of, of tension and friction that has been put in place by asking parents to be homeschoolers. Uh, make sure homework is clear. It's on material learns and not for self-teaching. We're not trying to have parents homeschool again. We're trying to remember that this is our job. Parents tasted it. They didn't want to do it. If they want to do it, they're going to be pulling their kids out anyway and homeschooling them. They were happily giving our jobs back to us, and we should be happily taking them. Make sure a lot of homework is relevant and interesting. Homework assigned must be accounted for. We should never assign homework and not check it. You can have children come to school and go in pairs and see if their answers match up. You can do a lot of things, but not checking homework at all really should be an answer to then don't have homework. And model, model, model. Model the way you want them to talk and model the way you want them to walk and model the way you want them to knock before they enter a door and model the way you want them to give out papers. If you make sure that in September, you're modeling, you're welcoming, you're making it clear, you're gonna end up with nine more months of really good teaching where the gap is getting smaller and smaller. Be clear, give directions in a few different ways, be consistent, and make sense. You know, the kids are gonna catch us when we don't make sense, they already do. And be willing to say, wow, okay, you're right, I wasn't clear about that. I'm writing myself a note, 
or Karen, please write down, um, or Kareem, please write down what I just said. I have to look it up tonight. Um, think, and, 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 and I'll look into it. They should know we're not perfect. They should know we also are learners. And it's okay if we didn't come in ready to teach a subject. We thought we were ready. Turns out we're not ready to teach it tomorrow. Think learning moments, not punishments. Don't walk into school ready to have power struggles because there's going to be a lot of opportunities for that to happen and we don't want them to. Be willing to say, hey, okay, I see you don't like what I just said. Tell me more about it. Tell me what's bothering you. Tell me how we can work it out. But don't think, oh my gosh, you're questioning my authority. They haven't been in school for five months. They're not used to authority. Think bad day, not bad kid. And I'm going to end before we go to questions and hearing about your formative assessment ideas with praise precisely. If you want the academic um, gap to really, really narrow, then you have to be very clear with your expectations and praise precisely. When children know what you value, they almost always rise to the occasion and meet those expectations. So it's really, really important to show students what you value and watch them go ahead and show you how they value you by following your expectations. Again, the expectations should be clear. Your praise should be precise. Your values and expectations will then carry over into the room and everybody will be following it. So now it's time for you to please share questions, share thoughts. Please go to the chat box. What, is there something that you are worried about in September that I did not address? Let's talk about that now. Please write in your chats and let's make sure that you leave today with a little bit of a calmer state of being. We can do this. It's not the first time that the gap is there and it won't be the last. There are schools that have big gaps that principals have walked in and raised the gap. There are classes that had teachers who weren't qualified and those teachers left and a new teacher came in. We're going to see gaps, but it's not something we haven't seen educationally before. Please take a moment. I'm going to go back to the formative assessment. This is the references if you want to look up any of the things I talked about. I'm going to go back to the formative assessment pages. And while I wait for people to chat a little bit, I'm going to share some of the formative assessment topics that we put on here. Okay, so this page, the new clothes, the do's and don'ts, and three most common misunderstandings we did discuss. The three questions, yes, no chart we talked about. Three questions are just, you know, children think of three questions and then they put them in the order of importance, low importance, medium importance, and high importance. And any one of these things can be done for um, weaker students and for um, high order thinking students. Um, they could be done for younger grades and older grades. It's really, they're all modifiable. Okay, explain what matters. You know, my father is um, a veteran teacher and it's unbelievable how he was able to teach children, I mean, in high school, who many of them had failed so many times that they were way older than they should have been to be in his class. And yet in his class, everybody always showed up. He was always dynamic and interesting. And he was able, he always said, you can, as long as you know it well, you can explain it to anybody. And he did have his students, he was a history teacher, explaining things to um, imaginary younger siblings or pretend you're going to second grade and you're explaining it to them. Um, and you really got to see if a child understood a topic or not, because if they can't explain it, they don't know it. Big picture, um, right? Uh, discussing how, why do we learn about the three branches of government? Because it helps us understand the big picture of how America was formed. The Venn diagram, we love the Venn diagram. We teachers, we've been diagram all over the place. Um, going ahead and comparing and contrasting. Draw it. Again, um, I believe that big kids should be asked to draw just like little kids are asked to draw. There's a really great strategy called um, draw, label, write. And draw it is really a very, a very simple way of talking about draw, label, write, which is before a child asks to write an essay or write anything, they quickly draw the scene, then they're able to label the scene, and they go ahead and write it, and there, there's less of a um, a writer's block because they have that scene in front of them where they're able to draw a label right. And although it's a, it's a strategy mostly used in the lower elementary school, I have used it in upper elementary school and the kids love it. 
and we really don't give them a chance to use all the different other areas of the multiple intelligences enough. And when kids are able to express themselves in song and in art, um, we get to find out that they really do understand what we're teaching them. Etty, I don't know if you see this, but there are a number of questions and comments now in the chat. Oh, good. So I'm going to go check them out. if you're able to take out. a look, yeah, there are a couple there, starting with Farrell or Farrell. So if you want to address those, we have a, just a few minutes left. We'd love to be able okay. to answer as many questions here, as possible. Here we go. Naftali, last night when we did our run-through, the chat worked, and now it's not working. So if you could just read me the chat, that would be very helpful. Oh, okay. All right. So <clears throat> the first one it seems to be more of a statement followed by a question. It is possible that we will see A and B groups with half of them in an active learning environment. We will likely continue to experience reduced face-to-face -face teaching time. Any ideas on how to overcome this problem? Okay, so if you mean that there's going to be two levels in a classroom, then we're gonna really be, um, we're gonna be walking into our classrooms thinking more center-based um, and much, more teach much less teacher-directed. If you're talking about the fact that we might be having more uh, distance learning built into our day, then we might want to think more about the, um, the flipped classroom approach, which is where we go ahead and we record a lesson. And then when we're together, we're able to work with the children on the higher order thinking and the, and the, the learning part. I guess what we used to say is independent practice and homework. And we can do much more of that. So if, in fact, our learning platform is set up for long-distance learning, for remote teaching, then that might be where we go. And again, as scary as it sounds, there's tons of resources for the flipped classroom and blended learning. And so we're not looking at anything that is going to be so new and so scary that we won't have anything to rely on. Um, so that's a really good thing to remember. Um, there, are few, I do, uh, there are a few others. I do wanted. see from Ruth, um, from Ruth in the question and answer, for some reason hers came up. Um, thank you, it's been five intense months of survival. I want to ask what we could do to children we were not engaged with throughout the period of COVID-19, and how can we apply all these strategies in a classroom of multiple intelligences, traits, and temperaments? Okay, so again, thanks, Ruth. Um, we're going to have to really make sure that um, we keep in mind that the less we frontal teach, and the more we do center-based learning and group learning, children respond to children much better. So we're going to do a lot of, um, and I see Janet, for some reason, Naftali, it came up again, it came up now. Um, um, I see Janet's worried about how do you teach a whole bunch of students with different levels, so that goes back to what Ruth is asking. The more we do peers, and the more we do centers, and the more we have children working in groups, they're actually going to learn much better than if they have to listen to us. And that's really hard for us as teachers, especially those of us who've been teaching for many, many years. Um, we have to keep in mind that just children learn better from children. So I advise you, we don't have time for me to do another whole hour, but I advise you to look up Jigsaw and Gallery Walk and different strategies that encourage peer-to-peer -peer, um, learning. Okay, so that's really important. Um, let's go to the chat, because now I am able to access it for some reason. All the times I tried. Um, okay, um, let's see from, okay, I'm accessing, but I am so far up, I'm reading where you're all from, which is amazing. Um, okay, and these are the strategies Naftali posted. Okay, Kelly, um, you are a returnee. Let me go down to questions. Okay, entrance tickets are a great idea, Sunny Langer says, and my students would really like it. It's a great way to start a lesson. Um, then let's go down to Learning Sparkles, talking about the A and B. So remember, you're gonna have, you're gonna have that. You're gonna have different levels in the classroom. I advise you not to always um, divide the class up by, by, by level, because children learn best from all different levels, but there are many times where they can be uh, they can be leveled and they don't even realize that in certain times of day they're leveled by ability and especially in that center-based classroom I was talking about um, they keep they don't know that when they're sitting with the teacher in that center they're being taught differently than when and they were sitting with their their friends in the independent section they're being taught differently they're all doing the same thing but each center they're doing something on their own level 
I hope that I that think was if helpful. I can, just because yes. we're running short on time, there's one comment or question from Claudia. If you could eyeball that as well as a question from Kelly at the very, very bottom. Yes. Um, while you do, I just wanted to remind everybody of a few different links that I shared at the beginning that I'm going to reshare over here besides for ways by which you can access your certificate and some other resources on my website. One focus area that we talked about at the beginning, for those of you who weren't here, is that we are hoping to roll out a teacher training bootcamp at DNI. And if you think that what you heard today was fantastic, which it was, and illuminating and packed with great content, you can only imagine what you're going to get from a much more in-depth, robust, boot camp that isn't trying to compress everything we know in education into 60 minutes or less. So I would encourage everybody to please take a few minutes, answer those questions, give us some feedback because that's going to help us to customize our offer. And Etty, before you go, because we, again, we are wrapping up shortly, please do leave information as well in the chat itself, whether that's an email, whatever you feel comfortable with, where people who want to follow up with you, who could learn more from you and may want to bring you to their schools physically, virtually, et cetera, for teacher training. How can people find you, talk to you, and engage with you further? Please do just chat that in there. I know people could get the recording and many will, but for those who just want to see it now and kind of bookmark it, please give them that information as well. So while you're doing that, I'm just going to point out that the question I was alluding to earlier Actually, we have another one from someone named User. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, one question related to- Yes, I just want to mention about- yeah. Go ahead. Yes, I want to just um, answer Kelly, the, one, the three to one strategy. Um, those, are great, those are great strategies as well. The answering um, three, three things that I didn't know before I came into class and two things that I want to look forward, I, I want to know more about. And one thing I'm going to look up for, there's many different variations, amazing formative assessment. And somebody else, I think it was Claudia mentioned, that we might not even see face-to-face -face our students many times, especially if some uh, states go to the every other day in class, every other day online. But um, I really believe in the phone. I'm begging everybody to keep in mind that we do have phones, and picking up the phone, and having children hear your voices, and asking them about their day, and asking them how it's going, and if there's anything that they're having trouble with. It takes time, but there's nothing that can compare it's that feeling of my teacher cares about me and i really I, I really think that everybody should try to as much as possible um as much as possible try to connect with their students on a personal level uh, find out their birthdays send an old-fashioned birthday card this is the year to say i am going to care about my students and i'm going to teach my students more than my material i'm going to connect because from connection comes a desire to please. And unfortunately, we need that desire to please to bridge the education gap. Thank you so much for having me, Naftali. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. I did put my information in the chat. I also have the information in front of you. Um, when you get the webinar that Naftali is going to send you, the second page of the slides I have all my information and all my background that you need to know. And um, thank you so much. My pleasure. And thank you again, Etty, for a very engaging and information packed session. Thank you all for being here. You will get the recording as Etty mentioned. And um, I guess that's it for now. So please do reach out to Etty for any additional support that you would like. And of course, if I can help you as well, I'll be delighted to do so. There will be more webinar content offered over the next series of weeks whether that's every other week or maybe once a month, depending on how things go over the summer. I know many folks are away, but we want to keep the learning going and definitely be on the lookout in your inbox for more information about that boot camp. Because even if you are experienced, as you can see, there's so much more to learn from being with people who have just been there for a really long time and are ready to share everything they know for the sake of professional development and growth. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks again for being here, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye now.